Genesis 1.1 says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And yet it's only a few chapters later in chapter six, we read that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Psalm 130 says, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O people, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem his people from all their iniquities. Father God, we praise you. Lord, we thank you for your steadfast love for us. Lord, we thank you that you would love us unconditionally. And Jesus, we thank you for, for your grace. And so Holy Spirit, we, we welcome you in this room and ask for you to, to lead us today. Jesus, we pray your blessing over this place in your name. Amen.
everything that we do and say and think this morning. I just pray that no person, no name, Lord, will be higher than you, Lord, in this place this morning. The name of Jesus will be lifted so high. And Father, I ask that you would send your spirit to teach us this morning, to change us, God. We need you. We don't pretend that we can do this without you, Lord. To come and move in our midst this morning for your glory's sake, for your kingdom's sake. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we are in a study on the early church. And what we've learned in our study is that they were designed like the synagogues. And part of, part of that is they, part of their gatherings in, from the very first days as Paul's planting his church is that people would, would stand together and they would repeat these words that Jesus says are the most important, that the Jewish people would say are the most important of all the commands of Scripture. We use, we use God's name Yahweh. It's the name that God said he is he's to remem- be remembered by throughout the generations. So, uh, and that's, that's the word in the... In the text. All right, so would you, say, would you declare together with me these words, repeat them together, um, or declare them together with, with joy and, and passion? All right, let's just say this together. It's not going to be the repeat thing, it's just going to be all together. Here we go. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone. Love Yahweh, your God, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. Amen. Father, God, I, I ask for this to be, be true in our midst. Lord, that you would help us to love you. That you would help grow a, a love and a passion for you, for your renown, for your name, for your reputation. For all things you. Bless this time. Speak to our hearts, we ask. In Jesus of Nazareth's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. What a wonderful day to, to spend, spending some time with God's Word together. Glad you're here. Glad you're here this morning. Let me, uh, let me start by asking you a simple question. A simple question. How do you feel about your future? How do you feel about your future? When you think about the days or weeks or, or months or years ahead of you, how, how do you feel about them? Do you feel hopeful? Do you feel excited? Are you expecting great things or, or are you feeling maybe worried, anxious, discouraged, fearful, low expectations, maybe even dread uh, for the weeks, days, months, years ahead? When you, when you look ahead, how do you feel? How do you feel about your future? We're in this study of Paul the Apostle and, and today we're going to look at an era ending in Paul's ministry and a new era beginning. In fact, we're not really going to hardly talk about this new era beginning, but he's at a crossroads moment, a decision moment where he's deciding what he's going to do next. We're at the end of his second missionary journey as we turn the corner into the third one. And we're going to, we're going to see him decide what he's going to do next. For the last couple of weeks, We've been talking about Paul as he's been in the city of, of Corinth. Uh, on the map here, uh, Corinth, the blue dot on, on the far side, he's been following the red line, which wasn't there, although in life that would be so easy, just follow the red line. And, and he's come all the way through there and he's gotten down to Corinth, which is this, basically the last major um, city on his, in his second missionary journey. And, and it, it hasn't been that great of a j- missionary trip. For him, I mean, it's actually probably the least wonderful of all of his uh, journeys, maybe excepting the one he dies in. But uh, but the second one here, and it's it's marked by several weird moments. Like when he's in that yellow bit there in, in Asia, he doesn't know what God wants him to do. He he all he knows is Jesus said, "Don't talk about Jesus here. You can't talk about the gospel in this area." And so he keeps moving, and, and he doesn't know where he's supposed to be going and he so he goes up north he wants to go into the purple bit up there into Bithynia but the spirit of Jesus says no you you can't go into there and so he's just keeping going but he doesn't know where he's supposed to go and and 
I think we all know what times like, times like that are like, where you're just in a season of life and you're like, God, I just don't know what you want me to do. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I, maybe you're in, that, in a season like that where you're just, you're like, God, I, just tell me what you want me to do. I feel lost. I feel like I don't know what to do next. I don't, I don't know what's, what's going on. Just help me. I don't know what to decide in this, in this moment. I don't love moments like that. <laughs> I, I'm sure some of you don't love those moments either where you're just kind of moving, but you don't know where. You don't know how things are going to go or, or where even you're supposed to be. Well, eventually he gets over to the coast, to Troas, and, and he gets this vision of a Macedonian man saying, come over here and, and tell us about the gospel. And so they, they get on a ship and they go over to the orange bit up there, Macedonia. The first city they get to is Philippi. Some people come to Christ there, if you recall. But also, he gets a severe, a severe beating. And he's beaten by rods. He's thrown into to prison in stocks in the inner cell. He, he's physically uh, shamed there in that city. Uh, and then from then on, from Philippi on, all through that orange bit, after he's gotten this vision to go there, he's basically spending sh- short times in each city. And then he's either shipped off in the middle of the night and uh, alone. And he just finds himself... In, in more and more alone, more and more on the run, and in, in brief periods of time in each city, you don't see the same kind of awakenings or revivals that took place in his first missionary journey, like when he was in Antioch or when he was in Iconium. That, that, there was great city-changing revivals. Here he's more on the run. He, he doesn't hardly stand still and, until he finally gets to Corinth. And he's, he gets to Corinth and he's alone. He's out of money. He has to work. He can't even talk about Jesus. He might still be recovering from the physical pains from being uh, so severely hurt in, in Philippi up there. I mean, looking back over this second missionary journey at first glance, it's just not as successful. It, it, it has a lot of, of, of painful times, hard times, lonely times, under threat and under pressure. And, and then he gets to the last journey, which we've, or last city, basically, which we've been looking at. And in his Corinth, and when he's there, after this tough run, the Lord encourages them. And, and I know I read it a month ago, but it's been a month. And we read in, in Acts 18, verse 9, it says, Then the Lord said to Paul in a night vision, Don't be afraid. The guy's been on the run. He's been beat up. Don't be afraid. But keep on speaking. Don't be silent. For I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you, because I have many people in this city. And he stayed there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. It's just every time I read that, that word from uh, the Lord to, to Paul, it's, it's just so precious that, that, that God would encourage him. It encourages his people to say, hey... Are, are you in a stressful time? Are you in a, are you in a hard era? We have a great God, a God who is with you. If you've given your life to Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit, you have God with you. God is with you in the good times and in the hard times and the stressful times. You're going to be okay. God is with you. Now just to clarify, he was also with him in Philippi. He was also with him in Thessalonica when he got ran out of town. He, he, in the next words, just because God's with him doesn't mean his life is going to be smooth, pain-free, easy. Okay? But the word is, God is with him. In Corinth here, the next words that we're going to read, I'm going to read them in a moment, but the next words we're going to read is that Paul gets attacked. And he gets drugged before the court, drugged before the, the judge's bench. I have a picture of where he's going to be drugged in front of here. This is in Corinth. There's the, uh, we talked about this, the temple of Aphrodite is up there on the top up there. The judge's bench is here, the bima, and there, the judge would sit on top of, or be on top of this uh, rather large platform. There might, I can't see from here, but there might be a, a pillar where you would tie the people to if you were going to beat them or something like that, uh, or chain them to. Um, I don't think it's, I see it right on this picture here. So Paul would be right here, 
in front of this bench, this particular one, and, and Gallio, which we're going to read about, is up there. Now, this just isn't any old judge's bench. All the towns have them, but this is, the, this is a judge's bench where the proconsul is. For proconsul. Now, we, uh, we've run across another proconsul in our study, a guy named Sergius Paulus. And remember, proconsuls are big deals. They're, they're the most powerful people outside of Rome. They're the most powerful, they have the most political power of anybody outside of Rome. Uh, only a senator or the emperor has more authority and more power. Uh, Gallio. Gallio's full name we know is Lucius Junius Gallio Ananias. And he was a proconsul from 51 to 52 AD here in this spot. Okay, it's one of the most certain dates we know of Paul's life. Anyway, so let me read what happens here at the judge's bench. In Acts 18, starting in verse 12 here. It says, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, again, the, the technical terms in the Bible, they're so precise. Uh, he was proconsul of, of Achaia. Uh, the Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the judge's bench. Hmm. I, I think I want to say a little bit more about Gallio before, before I go any further. What happens here at this judge's bench is, is one of the most important events in early Christianity. It seems like a simple story when you read it, but it's one of, the, it's, it's one, it's a, one of those moments that has a 10-year empire-wide impact for Christians. Okay, now before we talk about that, let me, let me tell you a little bit more about Gallio here. He's, he's proconsul, a big deal, but also he's a close friend of the emperor. Emperor Claudius. Claudius is the guy who kicked all the Jews out of Rome two or three years earlier here. He kicked them out of Rome because they were, seemed to be fighting about Christus, uh, this, this teaching about, about Christ. And, the, and it was so violent and so disturbing and so uncontrollable that Claudius kicked the, the, the Jews out of Rome. So he's, the, he's not only the proconsul, but he's a close friend of the emperor. Apparently, he's a senator as well. That I get from Wikipedia, so I, I have no reason to doubt that. He becomes a senator. His brother, his br brother, it doesn't say anything about Wikipedia, no. His brother is um, Seneca, a very famous philosopher, and his brother becomes the tutor of the next emperor, Nero. So his brother is tied in with the next emperor. Uh, Gallio becomes so close to Nero that he's the guy, he's the only guy that introduces Nero before his performances. Uh, politically speaking, this Gallio guy is intensely tied in with the emperors in this era. Highly respected amongst the most powerful uh, people in the empire. Mostly because he's a likable person and a strong, clear-headed leader. History records him as a sweet responsible, loving, well-liked person. If, if you want to take a, some notes about what I want to be remembered like, just go ahead and write those down. Well-liked person, uh, not too stirred up by the crises of any particular moment. So, Paul is in front of the judge's bench here, and he's in front of this guy, and this is what happens. It says, when, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the judge's bench. This man, they said, Persuades people to worship God contrary to the law. As Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of a crime or of moral evil, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. But if these are questions about words, names, and your own law, see to it yourselves. I don't want to be a judge of such things. So he drove them from the judge's bench. Then they all seized Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, the new leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the judge's bench. But none of these things concerned Gallio. Okay, so at this moment, politically speaking, Christianity becomes legalized. Or at least not made illegal. Uh, it's, it's legalized until Nero breaks out with persecution uh, in about a decade from now. It's, it's legalized by not treating Christianity as a separate or new religion, but as a sect within the accepted religion of, of Judaism. Now notice that Paul's not being accused of promoting a new religion. 
Instead of persuading people not to follow the Jewish religious laws properly in the, in the Jewish opinion. Now, near the beginning of the Paul study, I talked about this, but in the early years, in the lifetime of Paul, in the lifetime of Peter, in their lifetime, uh, Christianity was not viewed by a, a, as a separate religion, but as a renewal movement. A renewal movement within Judaism, which is also why the, Jew, the, the new churches that are planted look exactly like synagogues because they're just synagogues about Jesus as the fulfillment of the Torah. That They're designed the same way. Uh, if Christianity was a new religion, it would have to have been legalized, but it wasn't. And so it was just considered the, the promises to the Jewish people in the Old Testament fulfilled in Jesus. We're waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah has come. His name is Jesus Nobody thinks, no Romans, no Romans, no Jewish people, no Christians. They don't think of themselves as a different religion. Which is probably why you see so much angst and rage with the, with the Jewish people uh, over the message that it doesn't matter what your background is. It, the background was so important to them. It doesn't matter your, your, your background. It doesn't matter your baggage. It doesn't matter your past. In Jesus, everyone can be forgiven. In Jesus, everyone can be accepted. In Jesus, everyone is invited. That, that drove them crazy. It's why there's so much uh, controversy about circumcision. Because if Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, the, the, the Messiah that they've been waiting for, the King of the Jews, and it's not a separate religion, that how could you be a believer in Jesus and not also be Jewish? Because, because it's... I mean, and the answer is, it's a new, there's a new covenant that Jesus established, but it made no sense to these early Jews. It was, it was very difficult for them to think, think through. All that to say, if you're remembering in our study, it wasn't until Nero that this began to change in, with Romans. And then when the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, then it began to start to shift. But it wasn't until 135 AD that they were fully separated, Christianity and, and, and Jewishness. When, when the leadership of the church moved from Jewish people to Gentiles. Okay, so, but this moment here with Gallio buys the believers about a decade uh, of, of political freedom, a freedom from political persecution. It, it, it's a great moment here. But all that to say about Gallio, maybe you can think of someone like him. Someone who's a good person, someone who is maybe sweet, loving, intelligent responsible, respectable, good at what they do, but someone who is also indifferent to the message about Jesus. Someone who doesn't really care, who's not interested in hearing about it. We, we've studied two proconsuls in our study, Sergius Paulus and, and Gallio, and, and I just want to encourage you, both are successful, both are intelligent, but only one of them responded to the message of Jesus and one of them just couldn't be bothered, was indifferent about it. If you're a good person, you still need Jesus. If you're an intelligent person, you still need Jesus. If you're a kind and loving person, you still need Jesus. Don't take the path of Gallio. Galio, and, and ignore or being indifferent to, to one of this most important message that there's no other name given to people by which we must be saved. Either you give your life to Jesus and you're saved, or you do not. And there's no hope for you on that day you stand before God someday. Did you hear that? It's that simple. Either you give your life to Jesus and are saved, or you don't. Or you don't. And there's no hope for you on that day you stand before God. Good, successful, intelligent people need Jesus to be forgiven. Just like evil, deceitful, lying people need Jesus as well. All right, back, back to the big picture here. Even though, Paul, even though the Lord told Paul that, uh, that the Lord was with him, it didn't keep Paul from being attacked. Uh, and, and, and brought before a Gallio. Now, when I tell you, you who believe in Jesus, when I tell you that the Lord is with you, it's, it's not a message that says nothing bad is going to happen to you. 
It's not a message that's going to say nothing unpleasant is going to take place in your life or you won't face anything difficult. The, the message is that whatever you face, whatever you face, whatever challenges are in your future, whatever unexpected or disappointing things happen in your life, if you believe in Jesus, the message is don't be afraid because God is with you. I just want to make that clear because sometimes we think God is with me so therefore, I will have a life without pain. I will have a life without disappointment. That's not what that means. That's not what that means. And, and, and you see foolish people who turn on God when life gets hard. And they turn away from God because some tragedy takes place in their life and they don't like it. And they, they get mad at God. And they, they turn on him because, hey, I was believed in you, God, but you let this happen to me. And so you turn away from him. God with you doesn't mean bad things are going to happen. It just means that he's going to be with you in those dark moments. He's going he's gonna to be with you in those painful moments. He's going to be with you in those, in those moments of, of tragedy. Don't turn on God in the difficult days. Don't turn on him. He's your ally, not your enemy. He's your, your friend, not your, your adversary. He's the one who is with you to help you and, and to be close to you and to comfort you in those days. So that's Galileo. Now, I'm going to put the map back up on the screen here. And I'm going to read, and we're going to follow the red line as we finish the rest of, of Paul's journey here. I'm going to read it, and you can follow it. It says, it says here in, in verse 18, So Paul, having stayed for many days, meaning a year and a half, yeah, I'd count that many, said goodbye to the brothers and sailed away to Syria. Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He shaved his head, which is a beautiful look, by the way, <laughs> instantly becoming twice as beautiful. He shaved his head at... Uh, yeah, that place, because he had, he had taken a, a vow. Uh, no, it seems that S uh, Silas and Timothy and Luke, that they've, that they've stayed behind. That they're not here. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila are journeying with him. They've, so just as you're tracking, they're still in this uh, Greece, uh, Macedonian Greece area over here. Verse 19, uh, when, when they reached Ephesus, he left them there. Uh, but he himself entered the synagogue and engaged in discussion with the Jews. And uh, though they asked him to stay for a longer time, he declined. But he said goodbye and stated, I'll come back to you again if God wills. Then he set sail from Ephesus. Uh, again, we're going to find out that he leaves Aquila and Priscilla here in Ephesus. We're going to find that out in a few more verses. Um, uh, so again, Paul's alone again. He's alone again. On landing at Caesarea, which is down here, uh, down here close to me here. On landing in Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church in Jerusalem. And went down to Antioch, which is his home church where he begins his missionary journeys. Right here on the side here. And then it says, after spending some time there, he set out traveling through one place after another in the Galatian territory and, and Phrygia, strengthening the disciples. That's, that's on the next map for next week. But... But all that to say, we, we, we've come to the end of his journey here in Antioch. He's back to his home church. He's got Aquila and Priscilla in Ephesus. He's got Timothy, Silas, and Luke are, are back in Asia. And, he, and he's just back here at the end of his journey. He's got other people uh, teaching and proclaiming Jesus that he's, he's uh, raised up, that he's trained. And for, for Paul, it's kind of the end of a, another journey, an, an end of an era. An end of, a like I said before, a more painful journey, a less successful than his first journey time. And he's at a crossroads moment. He's at a crossroads moment, a moment of decision. Where Will he stay in Antioch with, at his home church where he's a teacher there, where he's able to um, strengthen the church there, or is he going to set out again? Is he going to remain in Antioch where he can teach and be a little bit more stable, or is he going to go back and, back and face that, that unknown, the, the scary unknown? I, I don't know what Paul's thinking there, but um, he knows that it's dangerous out there. He knows that to leave and to go back on a journey, every time he's been severely beaten, 
Every time he's been driven out of town, he knows what that, what that decision is going to be like, facing painful times ahead. I don't know, are, are you at a moment like this? Are you at a decision moment, a, a big decision moment, a, a crossroads moment in your life? Or one of those times where the decisions you're making are going to have pretty big, a pretty big impact on your life in the future. What your life is like and, and, the, and the quality of life. When I chose ministry instead of the United States Navy, that had a pretty profound impact uh, on my life. On my life. When I, when I chose Scotland over Seattle, that single decision has had a dramatic impact on my life. When I chose not to give up on this church in the early days when it wasn't happening... And, and, and go home, Th- that decision to stay and persevere has had a dramatic impact on my life and maybe some of yours as well. It, it, crossroads moments are big deal moments where you're deciding, am I gonna, what am I going to do? What, what decision am I going to make? And, and, and sometimes they're forced upon you, but sometimes they're just opportunities that, that come your way. How do you make decisions in moments like that? How do you make decisions when so much of the future hangs in the balance and you don't know what the future is in store? You know, Paul Paul doesn't know what's in store for him. In seasons like that, I I, I can't tell you what to do, but in seasons like that for me, this is how I I make decisions. I choose courage and not to succumb to fear. It's one of the things I do. I choose courage and not to give way to fear. I choose to have hope and not give way to pessimism. I choose hope and not to give way to pessimism. Uh, I've chosen to trust that God will be with me and not to believe that my future is up to chance. I I trust to believe that God's going to be with me and my future is not up to chance. And and I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and and I don't know if I'm going to reach my dreams in any decision moment or if all my hopes and dreams are going to be crashing down with this next decision. But what I do know and what I feel really confident about that no matter what happens, whether things go good or whether things go bad, is that God's with me. Whether, whether, Whether things go good or whether things go bad, that God's actually paying attention to me. Whether things go good or things go bad, that there's hope because the God who helps will help me. And the same is true for you who've given your life to Jesus. He's paying attention. He will help you. I I don't know. Sometimes in life you take those big risk moments. What would have happened if I didn't risk everything for Scotland? Or or, I I have no idea what my life would have been like in in that situation. Paul chooses not to stay in Antioch. He chooses to go forward, uh, and he's going to try and bring the message of Jesus again to these, these places. He doesn't know the pain that's in his future. He doesn't know what great things are in store. He doesn't know that all of Asia Minor, all of the yellow bit, is going to come to Christ because of this next journey. There's going to be a massive thing, a massive great... He doesn't know that. He walked through that area before, and nothing happened before. He doesn't know that a great revival is going to take place, a great awakening, one of the most powerful awakenings in the early church is going to take place in this next journey. But he also doesn't know he's never going to be back to this Antioch again. He's going to spend years in prison and he's going to die. He's not going to make it back to this place again. There's just so much unknown and, 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 and you know, he decides not to play it safe. You know, I don't see in this passage Jesus saying, Paul, now I want you to go again on another journey. Or the Holy Spirit says, hey, I want you to go leave Antioch and go to Ephesus. Or an angel. You don't get any of that kind of direction. All it said there was after spending some time there, which is pretty ambiguous as we've learned before, he set out traveling through one place after another. There's, this isn't some sort of like holy vision moment, it seems like. He, he, just, he just goes forward, trusting and, and, and following God. He knows it's going to be hard. He knows it's going to be dangerous and, and painful. But he makes that decision with courage. He makes that decision with hope and with expectation that as he goes, God's going to be with him. 
and with that passion to tell people about Jesus. How do you face your big decision moments? How do you face those moments in your, in your cross? Well, this is how I've been doing it. This is how I've been doing it. Sometimes you feel like God's leading you or nudging you, and sometimes you just don't, right? I, I tend to begin my, my big decision moments with a prayer like this. Father, just tell me what you want me to do. <laughs> and I will do it. I trust that you who know the future know best. And I, I trust that. So if you would just tell me, I would just do that. Who do you want me to marry? Where do you want me to go to school? What kind of job do you want me to do? Where do you want me to live? Do you want me to do this? Do you want me to, do want me to buy this super awesome sports car? No, no. <laughs> I don't know. Are you just throwing that Throwing that out, got just, if, and sometimes there's direction there, and sometimes there's not. You know what I'm talking about. And then, and then, I, if depending on that case, if I'm not really clear, I might say, God, I'm thinking of making this decision. And in those moments, I, it's very frequent. I write it down on a piece of paper, like Hezekiah, and I lay it before the Lord in prayer. I stick it out. I fold it out there in case he doesn't just hear, but he reads. And I place my hands on the paper, and I'm saying, Lord, this is what I'm thinking. This is this. Again, I just want to do what you want me to do. This is what I'm thinking. If you have a different idea, I would like to know soon. Okay? I just lay this out before the Lord. Just tell me. And again, you know, sometimes there's nudgings. Sometimes there's direction in that moment. And sometimes there's not. Sometimes there's not. And so, you know, I, I wait for a while. I keep laying that before the Lord. And then, when I feel like, okay, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm like, Lord, I ask you to bless me in this. Even if, I, I prayed this moving to Scotland, even if this is not what you want me to do and I'm just making this up, even if I'm delusional and I just, I just think this is what you want me to do, like, I'm not entirely confident, but, but I just ask you to bless me anyways, to, to go with me anyways, to help me anyways. You know, I say, look at my heart, Lord. Look at my heart. I only want to do what you want me to do. I think this is what you want me to do. I'm not getting a lot of clarity here, and so I'm going to do this. So, so just look at my heart and bless me if I'm wrong. Give me favor if I'm wrong. Help me even if I'm wrong. And this is, this is what I, I want you to do, and then I go for it. I'm just living trusting that God will be with me. And that God will help me. And, and I want to say that I choose to not judge the, the goodness of my decisions or poorness of my decisions based on what happens. Things went bad. That was a, probably a bad decision. Really? Because I'm looking at Paul and things go bad for Paul, but he's still making good decisions. He's still following God, and he's still going from place to place with the gospel, and he's getting beat up in prison and, and all that kind of stuff. You can't base a decision, oh, God wasn't in that because it didn't go good for me. Okay? I just, just want to throw that out. Trusting that God's going to be with you and, and, and that God will help you. Anyways, next week we're going to pick up with, with our study of Paul heading to Ephesus, but... But for now, I just want to pray, pray for you, uh, especially those who are making big, big decisions. And, and um, so this is what we're going to do. You don't have to stand. You don't have to stand. You don't have to stand. But my prayer only counts for those who stand. <laughs> so if, if you're at a moment where you're making a big life decision, where you're, it, it doesn't have to, I don't have to think of it as big. You just have to think of it as big. If you're at a moment where you're making a big life decision, I just want you to stand right now, and I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. Go ahead. Do it. Good. Everyone else, we all know what this is like. Go ahead and just stretch out your hands towards them, and, and what I pray, just be like, yes, I agree with that prayer. Just stretch out your hands, and I'm just going to pray. I'm going to pray that, that God will lead you. Let me pray for you. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Come, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, come. Lord Jesus, this is what I'm asking. Pay attention to these people who are standing right now in Jesus' name. Jesus, pay attention to them. You know 
everyone who's standing, you know the decisions that they're making right now. You know the, the choices in front of them. And Lord, I ask for help. Help them make this decision. Lead them in this decision. Nudge them. Guide them. In fact, I'm going to wait. Holy Spirit, I ask right now for nudging, for speaking. Speak to their hearts right now as they, as they think about this decision. What do you want them to do? Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. What do you want them to do? Lord, be loud. Be clear with us. It's, it's, these are hard days. What do you want us to do? Lord, I ask for courage over these people as they make these decisions. I ask for faith over these people as they make these decisions. Lord, bless Lord, why, do, why should you answer this prayer to guide your people? Because you are worthy of a people who are listening to you. You are worthy of a people who do what you want. So lead us so that we can do what you want us to do. Uh, help us in these decisions. Bless, bless and be with them. In Jesus of Nazareth's name I pray. Amen, amen. Have a seat. If you felt nudged during that time, I encourage you towards faith and not doubt. I've got three, two challenges for us today. I want you to, like I just did, I want you to pray for someone who's in a moment of big decision. For courage, for help, for direction. They don't have to be a believer. Uh, but I want, you to, I want you to pray for someone out loud where they can hear it. In fact, I want you to take your hands, I want you to place it on them. And I want you to pray that God would, would pay attention and, and speak to them and, and pause while you're praying. And just have a time of listening, okay? Want to do that? Uh, number two, if you're in a time of trying to make a big decision, I encourage you to ask your Bible read-through group to pray for you. Say, hey guys, I'm just making this decision. I don't want to tell you what it is, or I do want to tell you what it is, or something like that. I want you to pray, pray for me. Please pray for me. It's part of what that's for. All right, we're going to have the, we're gonna have the worship team come forward. We're going to have a time of worship here. Uh, in the balcony is a time of, of prayer and prayer ministry. Uh, on the side over here is communion. If you've given your life to Jesus, this is for you. And I encourage you to come over here. Take the bread, which represents Christ's body broken. You can dip it in the wine, which represents his blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. And eat it and remember that Jesus is alive. And that you've been saved. There's a communion station in the back hallway. If you're in the, in the back of the room or in, in the balcony, there's a communion station back there. Also, there's a place for your joy-filled offerings, which in this lectern here and in a basket out in the hall. I know many of you are, more and more of you are giving online. If you want to be doing that as well, there's some papers down here that can help you. But, but if you brought your generous and joy-filled offerings, there's a place in the, in the back in here. Also, prayer requests. Uh, we want to pray for you. If, you've, if you want to write down prayer requests, you can leave them in the basket in the hall or in the, in the lectern on the side here, a place called, with a marking for prayer. In the balcony is a prayer ministry team, and they will pray for you for anything. If you're new here or visiting, and maybe you're not even thinking of coming back, I highly recommend taking the opportunity to get prayer because you're here. I don't know what your other, where, if you ever get this opportunity, do that. Um, I specifically want to call people up. You can go up for prayer, by the way, for anything. For if you're sick or, or decision making, whatever. Um, the prayer ministry team wanted me to communicate that if you find it hard to trust God with your future, to go up for prayer. They want to pray for that, specifically today. Uh, sickness and bowel problems. Go up for prayer. Financial provision. Go up for prayer. If you need to let go of any Eastern mysticism, go up for prayer. And if you need to give your life to Jesus, if, if you're here and you need to give your life to Jesus, go up for prayer and they'll help you with that. You just go out these doors and up into the balcony and they'll, they'll tell you where to go. Church, stand with us.
Spirit of God, come, move, uh, intervene, direct, bless. Bless. In Jesus of Nazareth's name we pray. Amen.
Father, we look forward to that future day when Jesus of Nazareth returns and he takes his great power and begins to reign according to Revelation chapter 11. Lord, we look forward to joining with the great assembly of the ages, the great worship assembly before Jesus and declaring with one great voice, worthy is Jesus Christ, the lamb who was slain because by his blood he purchased us from every tongue, tribe, and people and nation. Until that great and glorious day comes, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all God's people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Good. We're, we're, one, of, one of our favorite things around here, we're going to have a, uh, a couple of baptisms right now. Uh, I want to invite up Claire, Ruth, and Cass uh, up here. We love, we love baptisms around here. It's, it's great. It's, it, we do this in obedience to Jesus and, and, and the New Testament where we're supposed to go and make disciples and baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here's the imagery of what's going on with a baptism, okay? This, this is, yeah, yeah, you guys can come on in. This is, this water is, represents a grave, okay, in baptism. Yeah, hi guys. Hi, hi everybody. Um, the, the water represents a grave, and the imagery is, this has already happened on the inside, but it's a test, this is a testimony. So, these three people have given their lives to Jesus, or at least we're going to confirm that in a moment, Okay. And, and so they're testifying to us that just like, just like Jesus died and buried and rose again, that they've joined, with, they've joined with Jesus in that. And so they get into the grave and as if this is they, them. And then we lower them under the water, which is supposed to feel like death. And it's so cold, it will. <laughs> and when you're under the water, it's supposed to, you're supposed to think, this is me dead. And then I bring you out of the water, and it's to be as if it's no longer I that live, but Jesus Christ living in and through me. It's cold. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to invite you, uh, wherever you're at, if you would like to come down and kind of surround the pool. It just kind of makes it more of a family time. If you, if you know some people who are getting baptized, elbow your way to the front. And if you, yeah, just kind of gather around. Yeah, good. <laughs> kind of gather around. We just do this family style. They're, they're, kind of scoot around this way a little bit. This is fun. This is fun. All right. So we're going to start with Claire. And, and uh, Claire, I just have a few questions for you uh, before we do this. Uh, have you, Claire, given your life to Jesus Christ? Yes. Okay. And are you committed to following him all the days of your life, no matter what? Every single day. Good. <laughs> uh, is there anything you want to say about why you're getting baptized today or what this is about for you? Uh, yeah. I've written it down so I wouldn't forget sorry <laughs> oh, thanks <laughs> um so first of all I just wanted to thank everyone who's came today um is uh, we've just all of us have just been blown away by our friends and family um, and just so touched that everyone's come to support us so I grew up um going to church I got involved um church very much became my life um, I got involved in absolutely everything that I could and became very good at doing all the church related stuff uh, I joined the church at 16, I was really excited about it, but Christianity was very much, it was a good way to live, um, and it, there wasn't really much of a kind of personal, real relationship with Jesus. I went to university and came to Glasgow about eight years ago, and um, there I realised just how much my identity had been so wrapped up in the activities and everything that I did at church, and then I just felt completely lost. I felt just such a fake, and then as I met um, other Christians, they just seemed to have something that was so much deeper, something that was more, something that was just so much more real. Um, and this just, oh, I just hid from this. It scared me. I got in a relationship with someone who wasn't a Christian, and I just went further and further away from God. Um, 
And after that relationship broke down, I went to Spring Harvest uh, with a group from church um, at the end of my first year of uni. And it was just there, God showed me just how, how far I'd gone from him completely. Um, and there he showed me that it was so much more than just about doing all the stuff and doing the right things, but that he was real and it, it was about following him. And just that it was, it was so not about me or anything that I did, but it was all about him and his amazing grace. Um, and every day he challenges me and keeps encouraging me to put my identity fully in him and not in anything else. So baptism is something that I have debated for a while. Um, more and more recently, God has been challenging me on it and asking me to do it. And ashamedly, I've been resisting because I became a Christian a while ago. So it seemed crazy to stand up here and say this. And I was really scared <laughs> of having to stand up here and admit that back then I didn't have it all sorted. I didn't fully understand it, um, but God showed me that really that was, I was being ashamed of, of God, ashamed of what he'd done in my life, and that I was denying him because of that, and so that's crazy, because I am so not ashamed, because I am so proud of everything that he has done, of everything that he's done in me, and is doing, and just of so proud of the amazing grace, and so I was reading in Acts, um, as Paul um, was speaking to eunuch, um, and he just told him about Jesus, and he said, as they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And that's why I want to get baptized, because I wholeheartedly believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, and I want to live my life for him. I got a few questions for you uh, as well. Just want to clarify: Have you dedicated your life to Jesus of Nazareth? Absolutely. And I, oh, uh, absolutely. Hello. Hi. If it's not on the mic, it doesn't count. I know. Well, there you go. <laughs> Trying to hold it too close. Uh, have you, are you committed to following him all the days of your life, no matter what? No matter what. Okay, good. Is there anything you want to say about why why you're getting baptized here? Um, yeah, just quickly about me. Um, I grew up in an amazing family um, who were Christian in an amazing Christian community. Um, but when we moved to Scotland, I found it really hard. Um, if you, I'm American, by the way, as well. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, I found it really hard to um, get into a church where I'd moved, and I fell away from God, and I fell away from Jesus. And it wasn't until um, my third year of university that one of my friends pretty much dragged me to ch church every single day of my life. Um, and she, she just kept on pushing me because she knew it was in my heart that I wanted, I needed God back in my life and I needed Jesus. And I wish I could say that I knew what happened, but I think I was just walking along one day and it just clicked and it was as simple as that. And I accepted Jesus and I accepted his forgiveness. And to say my life took a U-turn would not be even close to it because I was going down one way and I completely changed for him. And it's something that I'm proud of and it's something that I thank him for every single day. Um, so, and ever since then, that's three and a half years ago. And um, for three and a half years, I felt God calling me to baptism. For three and a half years, I came up with excuses. Um, I didn't, you know, maybe I wasn't the church or uh, I wanted to get baptized outside or I didn't want to get baptized outside and um, for three and a half years I kept on making excuses and not obeying him um, and eventually I just realized that um, I love Jesus, I love God and um, I need to publicly declare that to everyone and I need to stop being selfish on the matter and obey him. So, here I am. <laughs> Good. All right, Cass, I, I got a few questions for you. Cool. Have you dedicated your life to Jesus of Nazareth? Yes. And are you committed to following him all the days of your life, no matter what? Absolutely. Is there anything you want to say about why you're getting baptized today? Um, yeah. Um, so I've got a bit of a testimony that kind of relates to this from this week, um, especially. Um, Last Sunday, someone was talking to us about the Daniel fast. Um, so me and Leanne started doing the Daniel fast on Monday, um, just so we can get closer to God, learn how to just love God a lot more, um, and just take our, our flesh away from the things that we, that we, that we don't actually need. Um, yeah, and 
since we've been doing that, and also as well as to kind of have some supernatural breakthrough um, from some of our situations that we were having. Um, my personal one was the job, I think. Um, I've had a lot of trouble with the job that I've been in. Um, so I've been, I've been praying to God for um, just to get out, just to get out of the job and just provide me with a new job. Um, had a job interview on Friday, um, which was awesome. But before that anyway, um, there was something really specific Wednesday night. Um, of course, I think when you try and get closer to God and when you fast, I think the devil sometimes tries to take you away a little bit more from that as well. Um, I had a really significant dream where the person that was telling us about the Daniel fast, it wasn't that person, it, it was the devil, if that makes sense. Um, just saying things like, you don't deserve God's love, God doesn't love you, um, you're not worthy. It was, it was really intense. <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't the person anyway, it was the devil. But that day anyway, afterwards, I had a lot of hate. I woke up with a lot of hate. Um, yeah, hating a lot of people. Um, it was a bit of a significant day. But it was really weird after that because I was really struggling just to try and get out of it. I was quite, I don't know what the word was, like just not possessed, but just like, oppressed I think it was. Um, I was in Edinburgh that day and I kept on seeing these um, buses. I don't know if you guys have seen the advert on the, uh, on the buses. It just says, try praying. It was really quite weird. So like, um, every time it would come past, I was like, oh, okay. Um, I'll try praying. And I just kept on doing that every single time. And just all of a sudden, there was just a big release. Um, and I was really struggling because my job's to fundraise for Greenpeace, get new members up on board. I just couldn't fundraise that day. Um, and there was 45 minutes left of the day. And as soon as all that release happened, two people just walked up to me and signed up. So I hit target for that day. It was awesome, um, <laughs> which is great. Um, and then the next day, I had the interview and um, got the job and everything as well, so, which is really, really cool. Um, and it's just quite significant that all of this happened once I really chose to just get closer to God in this way. Um, and just this week is so significant now that it's a new change from the new job, a new life kind of thing, um, to being baptized and stuff today as well, and just walking a really like, good direction with Jesus. And I just want to commit my life 100% to just doing everything that God wants me to do. Cool. Yeah.